We began last Sunday, or I began last Sunday, preaching through the book of Romans, and we are studying that together as a church. If you would like to catch up on last Sunday's message, it is on our website, and you can certainly do that. We'll try to make sure that if you go to the church website, stephendalebc.org, uh, that each week, uh, sometime on Monday, that sermon will be loaded up there. If you want to watch live from home, you can find it on Facebook. And uh, generally, we take the live video down as soon as we get the uh, YouTube video up, and we'll put a link to that. So Romans chapter 1 uh, is where we are today, starting in verse 7, uh, going through verse 15, I believe, and still in the introductory portion of the letter. There's a lot of application uh, just in the introduction. I don't think uh, the Holy Spirit ever wastes a word in the Bible, each one there for a reason. Let's go ahead and read our passage of scripture from God's word, Romans chapter 1, verses 7 through 15, and I'm reading from a Holman Christian Standard translation this morning. The word of God, to all who are in Rome, loved by God, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of the news, the news of your faith is being reported in all the world. For God, whom I serve with my spirit, is telling the good news, in telling the good news about his son, is my witness that I constantly mention you, always asking in my prayers that if it is somehow in God's will, that I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I want very much to see you, so I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Now I want you to know, brothers, that I often planned to come to you, but was prevented until now, in order that I might have a fruitful ministry among you, just as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. So I'm eager to preach the good news to you also, who also are in Rome. So we have the introduction of this book of, of Romans, and I started with verse 7 today in order that we might see who the book of the Bible is written to. Most of Paul's letters, these epistles as we call them, these, these books of the New Testament, were written as, as circular letters. Now they didn't have printing presses or internet or telephone or TV or any of those kinds of things that were certainly accustomed to nowadays, and communication, especially mass communication, was not an easy thing. So what would happen is Paul would write a general letter or a specific letter to a church, speaking of some of the things of God, explaining some theology, giving some instruction, those kinds of things, inspired by the Holy Spirit that these might be uh, instructions from God himself. And he would send them uh, through a carrier to a certain church, and that church would, would gather and read through that letter, and then they would send it off uh, to another church to be read by that church, sometimes making a copy to keep for themselves. Um, and so these letters would, would circulate among the churches. And the churches didn't have but about the same number of people in them as we have in this room sometimes, and sometimes they were really big churches, but uh, they, they, these letters would circulate. So uh, the, the book of Romans is similar to that. I mentioned last week it was written somewhere, if you wanted to put a timeline on that, Acts chapter, uh, I believe Acts chapter uh, 20, verse 3, and um, that might be where you want to look to see what the timeline was like. 
let us um, let's work our way through this passage of scripture. Paul wrote, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, back to verse 7, to all who were in Rome, loved by God, called as saints. This is where uh, the letter was going, to Rome. To all in Rome, okay, that's, that's your big parameters there. Rome was the big city, loved by God. That doesn't shrink the parameters at all, does it? You need to know that God loves you and loves every person because God is love. Not because you deserve the love or you've done enough to be accepted by God. It's not a matter of God loving you if you do well and hating you if you don't. God loves. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's love is for everyone. Not everyone receives and experiences that love, but that love is an unending and perfect love that God has for every sinner. And I'm so thankful to God for his love for me. What a great way to start any thought to know that God is love and he loves you and he loves me. Called as saints. This is the next step there. Called as saints. Now this means that God has, has brought them into the family of believers. Called as saints. Now this doesn't necessarily mean saints uh, in the sense that they are living perfect lives. Doesn't necessarily mean uh, saints in the sense that they have uh, achieved some sort of spiritual victory. And it certainly doesn't mean saint in the sense of the, uh, the, the Catholic church tradition where you've got saint this and saint that and each one has a certain uh, special attention of God. It just means the sanctified, the one in whom God has done his work of saving. God sanctifies. He redeems. Saints are those who have been declared not guilty because Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for their sin. So, called by God to a new position, a position of saint, of sanctified. Loved by God independent of this. So this book uh, is addressed to people who are already saved. It is addressed to the church. And because it is in this Bible, God has chosen to use this letter for every generation of Christians to read and understand more of him. So, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because the news of your faith is being reported in all the world. Do you see there in verse 8 that Paul is, before anything else, he says, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you, new believer. I'm praying for you, even though I've never met you. I've heard about you. I've heard that you've heard the good news. I heard that you have formed a congregation. I've heard that you continue to tell others about Jesus. And I'm praying for you. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of the news of your faith. But this gets a little bit deeper. For God whom I serve with my spirit in telling the good news about his son is my witness that I constantly mention you. So God is, uh, Paul is not only praying sometimes, but praying all the time for believers, even the ones he's never met. Folks, I think this is a, a very easily overlooked example in the scriptures of what we ought to be doing as we live out our Christianity. Paul 
prays for new believers. He says God is the witness of everything he does, and he's praying constantly. That's his way of saying, you can know it's true because I serve God and he's watching me. By the way, isn't that another quickly overlooked thing? If we just read through the introduction of the book. And Paul said, for God, whom I serve with my spirit, in telling the good news about the Son, is my witness. God witnesses everything we do. We don't come into his house and he sees us in here in the church building on Sunday, but he sees us in every moment. He watches us when we're sleeping. He knows us. He witnesses everything. Paul said that he is praying for these believers constantly. We'll see, as we already read, that Paul's never been to them and he's tried to get to them and still hasn't been to a place where he's seen them. Here's a question, because we are separated one from another by mass, social distancing, self-isolation, uh, closure of businesses, limited number of people gathering in certain places, limited travel. How can we encourage other believers? How can we help other believers? How can we minister to other believers when we are prevented from being side by side and face to face? Paul gave us the example right here. He said, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. He said, with God as his witness that he is constantly mentioning each one. So just for us to have a practical application to this, I put together a calendar this week. Rather, I asked our secretary to do it. She's really good at that. Um, Excel, but here is a calendar. Now, it's not a normal calendar. If you look at it, it's not a single month. It actually starts today on August 9th and goes until September 17th, which is 40 days. And then the members and friends of our church are listed, kind of spread out over the days of 40 days on this calendar. You know, if, if you were to take a hundred people and say, I'm going to sit down and pray for a hundred people. You can't do that meaningfully in five minutes. It, it's very general, right? When you try to pray for a hundred people in five minutes. If you take an hour, you still can't give but about 30 seconds to each one. That's not as deep and meaningful as, as it ought to be either. But if you take a long list of people, a prayer list of whatever else, and you divide it out on a calendar like this, instead of having a prayer list, you have a prayer calendar, then we have two or three names on each day. You can pray for two or three people in a very meaningful way each day. And through a period of faithful praying for 40 days, have prayed for every member of our congregation and every friend of our congregation, those who are not members but who attend with regularity, who have some significant connection. And so if you spend 10 minutes praying for three people, you can pray very meaningfully for each one. And every member of our church could be prayed for in a meaningful way. But this is what Paul was doing, is he could not go to Rome in person, he sent a letter, and he prayed. What a great example for us. So if you picked up a bulletin this morning, or even if you haven't, these prayer calendars are on the table in the foyer in the back of the church. And I encourage you to take one or two, bring it home, and put it in a place where you will use it every day. If that's your refrigerator or beside your bed or what have you, and find at least one time a day that you will pray for the names on that day of the calendar. And then pray in a meaningful way. It's not like, Lord, pray. I pray for the three that are written down on that little square. But rather, look and pray as best you know for every situation in the life of the person that's on that list. And if you don't know them, you know, this might be your opportunity to figure out who they are and how to pray for them.
So you can call one of our church members and say, I don't know who this person is. Tell me about it. And you can pray about it. So to follow Paul's example, let's pray constantly. And know that you're prayed for. And each individual member of your household is prayed for. And that you're praying for others. Would you commit to doing that with me? 40 days of praying. Would you just nod your head if you would commit to do that? Do it the best you can anyway. I believe we can follow Paul's example by doing that. Paul constantly prayed for those Roman believers. Now, in verse 11, Paul said, For I, very, I want very much to see you, so that I may impart some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, to be mutually encouraged, by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Here is Paul the Apostle. He is, um, he is preaching with the authority of God. He is teaching the, the revelation of God, the mysterious truths, as he called them, uh, the secrets revealed about how Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of God's gospel, of the Old Testament, and the hope of each one. And these Roman believers are those who have just simply received the message on faith. Certainly, when you talk about the spiritual level of devotion, you're going to have Paul up here and maybe these new believers here. When you talk about the depth of biblical knowledge or spiritual knowledge, Paul is going to be up here and these new believers down here. When you talk about the Christian um, disciplines, the habits that have been developed over a time of serving the Lord, Paul's spiritual habitual living is going to be right here, and maybe the new believers here. And Paul wants to be with those new believers. He says that I might impart some spiritual gift. Now, this is not uh, laying of hands or they pray in tongues or something like that, but the idea that they would be blessed and improved in their spiritual life by simply spending time with Paul and receiving what he has to offer. But he doesn't stop there. He said it would be mutual. That is to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Ministry is not this um, position of, of condescending, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but I mean uh, of top-down um, giving. It's not, I'm up here and I have all of this and I'm going to hand it down to you, you poor soul. It is a mutual relationship whereby even the one who is strong in faith grows and is encouraged in his faith by the one who is new or weak in the faith. Because God uses us back and forth that we might encourage one another. If you have had the privilege of discipling anyone and helping anyone get closer to God, then you know that you also grew closer to God through that experience. Did you not? When we, when we do the ministry that God has called us to do, it's not just for the benefit of others, but for our own as well. And when we minister to someone, it's not this thing where I'm, I'm, I'm this benevolent person that's just having pity on someone else. It is a mutual kind of thing. We become brothers and sisters. And we spur one another on to growth and righteousness. But here Paul said, verse 13, Now I want you to know, Brothers, that I had often planned to come to you, but was prevented until now. Has that ever happened to us? Oh, has that ever happened to us? Have ministry plans? Make wonderful ministry plans? Set ministry plans in motion? And then are prevented and then we can't do it? Oh, that's happened to us. Unexpectedly, plans change, don't they? Things 
that are not part of what we expected happen. This is part of our story as a church. In 2016, the floodwaters came. In 2020, the pandemic came. We had plans. We were doing things in ministry and suddenly we're prevented from that because things changed. What did Paul say about this? Well, he wanted those that he had planned to go visit to know it was in my plans. And it's still in my plans. But it was out of my control. He's praying for them. He's writing letters to them. And he's still planning on going and seeing them. When plans don't work out the way we expect, it doesn't mean that the plans were wrong. It doesn't mean that God is against us. May simply mean that it was not in God's time. But keep pressing on. I had expected we would be doing many things as a church this year that we are not doing. And yet we will press on in ministry. That's what we do. That's what Paul did. Plans didn't work out as expected, he just kept on going. Now look what he says here. He wanted to have, in order that I might have a fruitful ministry among you, just as among the rest of the Gentiles. I'm obligated both to the Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish, so I'm eager to preach the good news to you also who are in Rome. The Greeks and the barbarians, that's interesting. Neither of those are Jews, right? Those are different kinds of, of Gentiles, as, as uh, the Jews would call them, non-Jewish people. The Greeks would be the the, the uh, culturally elite, they follow the Greek culture, they speak the Greek language, they understand uh, the Hellenistic uh, principles of the age, and yet uh, the barbarians were those that didn't speak Greek uh, and did not fit into that Greek Alexandrian culture, and um, their, their language sounded strange to the Greeks. It sounded like everybody was saying bar, 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 bar when they talked, and so they called them barbarians. That's where the word came from. And Paul said, I'm, I, you know, you may, you may wonder what kind of person I'm bringing this good news to, who I'm obligated in my ministry to. It's not just those in Rome. It's not just those that are cultured. It's not just those within a worldview that I can understand. It's even the barbarians. It's not just the wise. It's also the foolish. Now, he's not saying this in order to to say bad things about someone, but just to say that there is no barrier that he will not cross. There is no kind of person, there is no kind of culture, there is no kind of language, there is no kind of race that should not be uh, welcomed right on in to the family of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has an obligation to each one. I find that a wonderful message. And as we look in ministry, to whom we will have our impact, for whom we will pray, to whom we will go, we don't look for those who fit within our lifestyle or within our culture or within our comfort. We look for everyone everywhere who simply needs to hear that message. Now there's a, there's a missionary, um, I think he's, he's going to be with the Lord now, who, um, who had uh, explained a little bit about how missions works. And he said there's a distance that the evangelist has to travel to share the gospel. Sometimes he has to cross a single barrier, which is that of culture. Sometimes he has to cross another barrier, which is that of language. Or another barrier, which is that of a worldview, a way of thinking about the world. Or another barrier, which is that of, of, um, of uh, animosity between two groups. And the evangelist goes from being evangelist to missionary based on how many barriers he has to cross. He said, but there's another way to look at it. You can also look at the individual who is out there. 
and think of how many barriers they would have to cross to be able to come and worship meaningfully in your church. Would they have to cross a barrier of culture? Would they have to cross a barrier of language? Would they have to cross a barrier of worldview, of, of, of family? Uh, some families would just completely disown somebody if they came and worshiped in church with us. And he said, we have to look at it from both perspectives, how far we have to go and how far they have to come. And Paul is saying here, there's an obligation that he has, both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. He said, so I am eager to preach the good news to you also who are in Rome. One thing I can't help but see in this passage, this introductory passage here of Paul's letter, is his excitement about what God is doing, whether it's here or far away, and his excitement about what God wants to do through him. He has a, a, an engine rearing, ready to go every day, because God is at work every day. And boy, I hope that we can get that kind of passion, that kind of zeal, in our daily walk with Jesus. I had um, one more point I wanted to draw out, but I think it would turn into another sermon. <laughs> and I think we are at the place we need to be for today. I want to encourage you to be in prayer, to be in ministry, and to be encouraged even when plans change. God is at work. Let's make it a point to follow the example of what Paul has been doing at this point in his letter. Would you stand with me? I'll have a time of prayer and invitation. And if God is speaking to your heart, that you might respond to him, then you come forward after our prayer and during our time of invitation. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this gathering today. Help us have a heart of zeal for ministry, just like Paul. Recapture our passions for your gospel, 